think it's important because you have an important number of smallholders and communities that somehow they depend on forest resources. And if you look at forest resources, probably the main source of income is timber. And this is even more important because the process of granting tenure rights to smallholders and communities that makes that sector much more visible and they also have gained uh, more capacities and resources to use this res the timber that, that they have access to. So they are becoming an important player in the timber markets. That doesn't mean that you don't have an important group of uh, large-scale industrial and well-established yes, industrial sector. So and these two sectors are coexisting and they use the resources, but uh, smallholders over time, and because most land is being granted to, to these people, so they are getting more access to resources and, and they are getting a larger portion in the markets. And, and this is important because the, the contribution that timber has on the livelihoods of these communities and the smallholders. So I think over time we tend to uh, get more knowledge about the fact that there are much more actors involved in the, in the forest production and in the timber markets. It's not just about smallholders and communities using the resources or intermediaries buying the timber, but also there are well-developed uh, sectors providing services. You know, there are foresters working on the forest management plans, providing technical assistance to communities, enterprises. You have the chainsaw millers that also they have a role to play into the production and in the market. And so there's a important number of actors that depend on, on the sector. And that makes this production and, and markets a bit more complex than we used to think in the past. No? You have said that and, and with regard to your second question, I, I think there's a false assumption that you can split the realities between what's formal or what's illegal and, and what's, what's informal or illegal and what's formal and legal. Because in practice, well, this is a more arbitrary concept, conceptual uh, uh, distinction because in practice I think these two realities they tend to coexist are very much the two sides of the same coin and I may say that probably every actor in, in the Amazon is a bit legal and a bit illegal also very much depends what are the degrees of legality or illegality no, because those realities coexist, so it's impossible to, to, to distinguish them in practice. No. I think it's important to have more flexibility in the regulations, or at least the regulations. Well, the problem is that the regulations in the past, they have been inspired in just one model on how forest management would be possible uh, and uh, that model has been trying to, to impose in different actors either indigenous communities, colonies, caboclos, whatever and I think the laws they have to recognize that the different actors, different groups, they may have a different idea about how to use the forest and why do they use the forest for? For example in, in Ecuador uh, and that's interesting from the data that, that we collected in the field that uh, smallholders that they don't follow the, the law, they tend to extract less from the forest, less timber from the forest. And the smallholders that follow the law, they need to extract more because they have to pay for the permits. So I think it would be much uh, better to have a more flexible system that could adapt you know, to the different ways in which people is using the forest. So to have a more plural and flexible way of thinking about how regulations can be implemented in practice. I think that's very important.